Assalamu alaikum, bismillahirrahmanirrahim. To each and every one of you, first and foremost, allow me first to thank Sheikh Fadlala for coming uh, to Cape Town once more to grace us with his presence. We are looking forward to not only today, but also tomorrow, uh, which is the full day conference tomorrow. And also thank you to Dr. John Martini for agreeing to this meeting, both of you, and for also coming all this way out to come and have a conversation with us. For now, we are wanting to engage in the conversation between what I would believe to be two very great teachers, whom I refer to both as master teachers. So I have known John for 11 years, going on 12 now. He's been my teacher in human behavior and in self-development and consciousness. And six years ago, I found the work of Sheikh Fadlala and a light bulb went off. And that light bulb was that I finally got to experience my secular understanding of consciousness, of human behavior, of the human spirit, through what Sheikh Fadlala has been teaching for so many years. I'm not going to go into the accolades of both these men because it is long and it's extensive and it's beautiful. I want all of us to listen to the two of them have a conversation about what they've decided to have a conversation about today. <laughs> if it means that they're going to sit in silence, then so we too shall sit in silence. <laughs> um, but yeah, two very great revered teachers of mine. Um, and I'm very grateful that each and every one of you, all of us are grateful, the entire committee, that you have come to experience this with us. Um, and also a particular mention to my students who are here, because you'd know the work of both, because I've been teaching you the work of both these great men. So thank you so much. Over to you, Bismillah. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to do silence, aren't we? <laughs> well, silence is the foundation of whatever is known and unknown. Whether you believe in anything or not, the entire universe or the cosmos has emerged from absolute silence, absolute peace, the absolute origin. You may call it other names, God, the divine, the universal sp spirit, whatever name. But that is the origin and that is the destiny. And if anybody is really seeking any transformative knowledge, it is that that we are looking for. But without that in our own heart, in every heart, we wouldn't have been where we are, searching, looking, enjoying, acknowledging, or turning away from. So that's all what there is. But each one of us, in a way, represents the evolution of billions of years from one little cell, which is semi-permeable, where this mysterious thing we call life was touched and over billions of years grew into this most complex being, so-called Homo sapiens. So we all, each one of us, represents that universal magic or miracle. So all what we need actually is to be more quiet, genuinely, voluntarily, by choice, in order to enter into the silence from which every sound, every color, every creation has emerged. So there are as many ways to this discovery as there are breathings. Not necessarily just humans, every, everything else that's hanging on air, looking for security. So that is why the sublime and the ridiculous are ever together. Here you want security, 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 security. Then the entire truth appears as insecure, seeking its origin, which is ever there, but not tangible, not visible, but leading, emanating, showing all of the other things which we call real. Let's get back now into the real thing. What is real? It's all transitory. Before you said it, it has changed. So. Our origin is absolute, is cosmic, is boundless, 
not subject to changes in space or time. And yet the human side is this. And really all what I learned is that the human being is the interspace, the middle, as the Buddhists and many, many other teachings say, middle people. Middle between the infinite and the finite. Middle between a, a silly blip of a biography, I was born and then, and then the light that is inseparable from the cosmic light. So if there is anything to be done, it is to put these two things together, which they are in themselves, in their essence, in their truth. They are not subject to space and time, manifesting in space and time. This is not a philosophy or some fancy. It is the reality. That is why nothing will satisfy an intelligent person that is within space and time, because you know it will change. It's not durable. It's not reliable. So we call reliable, it's more reliable, more reliable, less reliable. These are all words. But the most reliable entity ever is your own soul, because it's not separate from the cosmic reality or spirit. So the only thing I really learned is that if you have a purpose in this life, if you have a duty in this life, is to resonate the so-called you with the real you, which is not subject to you. You are subject to it. That's all. It's not a big thing. It doesn't require 50 years of studies or hundreds of books. It requires honesty, sincerity, silence, and readiness to die. Because the illusion that you are this and that and others is always scared and is frightened by its demise. So the ego, or what the so-called you, wants to always prop itself. But what do they do after me? But I am helpful. I am zero. I've got charities. I've got teaching. It's all a fantasy of you to maintain the so-called you. The so-called you is only a shadow of a light. And that light is cosmic. Everyone has the same light modified in different versions to the rat and the bat and the gecko and all of them have life. Different intensities, different complexities of that entity which we call life, which is a form of complex lights and millions and billions of different energy waves and transmissions and oh, hundreds and hundreds of known and unknown forces that we only discern the visible, tiny bit of it that touches our tiny earth. So the rest doesn't matter. Every few years you find astrophysicists coming up with the new fads. Every few years there's some new fad. The latest has been black holes. Now black holes were an idea which were easily 50, 70, 80 years ago. But anyway, so we're all the time trying, I got it, I got it. But the truth is that you begin to understand that it had got you. So it's the other way around. <laughs> Once you know it had got you, there's no problem. Enjoy it. See it. Yeah. Be at one with whatever appears with the touch of that oneness. That's it. That's really all what it is. I'm delighted to be here because I know all of you here are also, you intend well. And the amazing self-organizing nature of reality or truth, whatever, is that you will move according to the intensity of your sincerity and honesty. So we are here this afternoon also to share that which is already there before us and it will be there after us. And it is there within us. So I welcome you. I'm delighted to be with you. <laughs> Beautiful. What can I say? He says it. <laughs> Uh, everything you just stated um, is very uh, in line and very similar to the things that I've been exploring. It's quite inspiring to see another reflection of myself. What he just called the soul, the ruha, the nefesh, the spirit, is... Um, I, I use the sacred 
name called the state of unconditional love, the state where we have no conditions for where we're just present. And oftentimes we go and explore and go into a, a less subtle aware, awareness and we explore the realities that we make up and we judge those realities. We make attractions, repulsions, we look up, we look down, we create complementations of opposites that we oscillate through. And there are, are judgments for our experience. But deep inside us, in our heart, there's a, an entangled knowing that this is just an experience and there's something beyond that that we are actually part of. When we judge down below and we get infatuated or resentful, we're too humble to admit what we see in the things we look above to. We're too proud to admit that the things we look down on. But there's nothing out there that's not us. And when we realize that that's all one, and we realize that it's all love, we transcend that grosser reality and have a glimpse and calling to what's inside us that yearns to express with grace and equanimity and presence that which is beyond that reality. And we automatically um, need those illusions as the driving forces and voids that yearn to be fulfilled. And our individual experiential journey is a result of those illusions, those hallucinations that we call life. And, but ultimately it's the realization that there's no duality or separation in that we just thought there was. And when moment we do, we have inspired grace, confirming that we now have got a glimpse of what actually is. We don't know the boundaries of the cosmos, but the more I've explored it in the stream of consciousness, billionth of a second at a time, there's nothing but love. All else was an illusion. And we have to go through our, our illusions until we're ready for that truth. The moment we do, we have confirmation of that. There's such a profound grace state, such a profound uh, magnificence that we're, we're speechless. We go into silence because there's no words. Words are things we use in time and space. But we get to a point where we're extracted out space and time from our mind and just become present in our soul. And we have a glimpse of that cosmic presence, cosmic consciousness, if you will. There's a panpsychic cosmic consciousness that permeates everything, everything that we can perceive and beyond our perceptions. But we live day to day in our daily realities, and that's what makes society works. But as the individual inside, uh, which transcends the social needs and the conformities and the rules and the moralities and dualities that we run our lives by, there's a knowing an ever-present knowing that there's nothing but love, all else was illusion. So I think we have a very similar construct. I don't, I don't see any difference there. I think we have a magnificence. I believe that our physiology, the more I've explored the depths of the cell and the physiology, the more humble I am. Because I really believe that every physiological response to our perceptions that are skewed and biased every intuitive response to our misperceptions, every sociological feedback we get from our experiences interacting with others, and every cosmic experience, whether tragic or comic, is nothing more than a feedback to uh, initiate us into the realization that there was nothing but love. And they're just feedback mechanisms uh, attempting for us to realize that um, all of our distinctions are our, our journey of illusion. But the moment we actually become really present and extract out space and time from our mind and become a causal and more universal in nature, uh, we have the, the true breath of, of uh, life. And then we, we, we cannot go backwards.
well, once we've had an experience of that, there's no, there's a knowing. And that knowing, we can't know when we're in our polarities, but we can know when we are in a state of grace. And that is the, that allows us to realize that the seer, the seeing, and the seen are the same. We're all reflections, and there's no distinctions. On a universal level, I think we can't even use the term. We, we're, we're trapped sometimes in our language using the term that we come from this, we go to that, but even that's part of the illusion of space and time. So we just have to realize that it's all just present, and it's just a game of the mind. And that if we transcend that by seeing equanimity, seeing both sides synchronously, we end up realizing the divine uh, in the experiences that we think are our human experiences. I always say, where is the divine not? Wherever we don't see it, it's our illusion. If we look again and look deeper, more subtle than the gross perceptions, we realize that the highest frequency of awareness, there's, there's the divine waiting for our awakening because we've been slumbered in our, our misperceptions. So I think that we have, I don't see much distinction in our message. It's pretty, pretty similar. There is only sameness. Everything else in existence is differentiated sameness. If you are really looking at higher consciousness or the origin or the cosmic foundation, you find it is same, same, same. There is nothing else to do or say in our, this tiny little earth that we have nearly destroyed. But just to elaborate on a point that we have just heard, very interesting, in that duality is the cover-up of cosmic unity. So it, is, it has also within it the sacredness. So that's why wherever you look, there is a touch of the sacred. And so it gets diluted, diluted, diluted. Otherwise, it's too powerful. We can't take the absoluteness. So it is the story between the absolute, the amazing, unique oneness that you can't even refer to as oneness because it's not part of a two or a three. It is, if you like, none other than it. The same all religions, all awareness, all awakenings, all great teachers, prophets, alluded to the same thing. But for centuries, the separation, the distances on earth created all the so-called differences. But you go into the essence of it, same thing. All what they are trying to say is that separation, duality, differentiation, warfare, war and peace is all at the lower level of consciousness. It is human consciousness. Therefore, humanity has to arise. And it has, the last few hundred years, tremendous strides in humanity have taken place. You know, fairness, you know, helpfulness, all of the other qualities that we ascribe to empathy, sympathy, goodness, all of that. So we have come a long way. Now we are at the cusp of something else which is more vertical rather than horizontal. The, the horizontal one is very luxurious. Because there were ethics, moralities, what is true, what is not true. But nowadays you can't distinguish between that anymore. You don't know what are the extent of the lies or the cover-ups or what are the other, if you like, hidden agendas, which on the face of it is very, abhor you know, very abhorrent. So look at it in the face of it. It's not good. It's not nice. Look at the world. Look at the warfare. But then stop that enter into neutrality, and look at it with the sight of the divine. Because the purpose of this whole little experiment is for the divine to be recognized, known, and to be at one with. So from that point of view, why is there so much corruption, so much abuse, so much this and so on? It's so that we move into the vertical. So as you become accountable entirely for your thoughts, your intentions, your actions totally responsible with the ultimate referencing of the original light which is your own soul or the source of your life. So there is now the beginning of a major, if you like, spiritual uplift. And like a birth, it is very painful. <laughs> so there are double-double. There is nothing in creation ever unless it's one of twos. So there was your birth from your physical 
you know, whatever your origin, your mother. And then now there is another birth from the so-called you, which you invented with the help of others, your biography, over these years. I am this and I am that and I am disqualified and I am this. I... They all have a touch of the truth. There is no lie ever without it having a spark of the truth. But we, we know that's not good enough. We want to recalibrate with the absolute truth. The absolute is very difficult. It's impossible. So that's why it has been diluted over billions of years for the earth to be able to have this ultimate liar, the so-called human beings. I am this and this is nice. So in order for the high, high, high potency of truth in the heart as a soul to be, to be able to accommodate all of this fantasy. I've done this and I, where did you get it from? Where was your energy from? Who gave it to you? Where will it end? Who are you? So again, every one of you will know that ultimately it's through discarding what is not. I thought I was this, I thought I was a good child. I thought I was, no, 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 no. So it is no, no, no. If you say no, no, no forever, so the yes will shine because there is nothing else left. <laughs> the yes cannot show itself clearly if there are all these shadows. So it has to be done through true bereftness, humbleness, simplicity, willingness to die because you know death is not the end of you. The real you is a soul which has no beginning nor end. So it never dies. So you have discovered the truth that is not subject to space or time, which is a touch of the divine in you, in him, in her. Therefore, we have to regard all other living entities with a touch of sacredness. So, with true respect, then that respect translates into the human side, which is easier. It comes into all kinds of empathy, sympathy, love, and so on. Love is a field of energy that unifies. The entire cosmos is unified. So love is something we as humans also experience, mostly through its opposite, which is its hate, fear, suspicion, being let down. Oh, I really loved him or her or it or the money, and it let me down. Money ran away from me, and whatever, whatever. So you have to read the map of duality as emanating from that amazing cosmic unity. So in truth, meaning in timelessness or the most durable, the most sustainable, is not subject to space, time, or definition. Whatever we define is within the realm of duality, which is our earthly, if you like, home. You are at home here, but in truth, the real you is an alien, is a spirit. Where is the spirit? Where does it come? Where is its home? So we are all aliens passing through in a passage here. If you have discovered that all of what you thought were true had a touch of the truth, but the truth is really that immutable, eternal light, which is the source of your life, and you can never know it because it's the source of all knowledges. So how can you know that? which is giving you the bit of knowledge. So you give in to it, you accept it, and you truly then smile, and you have the best of short lives on earth in order to realize eternal life in heavens and on earth and everywhere. And that is the divine, and that is God, and that is the sacred. But in truth, the touch of the sacred is throughout the known and the unknown. So that is the dominance, if you like, of the divine. That is the ultimate cosmic control, if you like, or governance of everything. We as humans are given a little bit of leeway to pretend that I can do this. I can lift my hand. It's an impossible even to imagine how is the mecha mechanics of you able to move your hand or to know that you can't move it as well because you have pain or whatever. Look at the miracle upon miracle upon miracle. So... You, are, you accept the 2, 3, 5 percent, whatever, of the energy you have that you can actually act. It's a pseudo-action. In order for you to be in awe of the cosmic activities that goes on way beyond 
any possible imagination of, of light years. Impossible. So you're humbled naturally and you're honored by having been given that at the same time. As much as you are humbled in your own eye, in your own heart, you also feel you are honored by being given this life. What more than that is there? So what is there you are looking? Where is your ambition then? So you truly end up where the beginning is wholesome. That you are correct, you are gentle, you are right. And if you have pain, you announce it. And if you are not, if you, are, if you don't, whatever it is, you are honest. Honest more than what you consider to be humanly honest. That in truth, you have nothing. You will have nothing. There is nothing other than it. So that is all what it is. Then there will be more and more people, especially in the coming generations, where they don't have the same drive and ambition to do more, to develop more, to own more, to control more. It's beginning now. So I think the spiritual side of human awakening, awareness, enlightenment, whatever name you like to give it, I think it's beginning. Because we have nearly finished and killed the earth with our so-called progress and development. There will be more and more and more people who will be in their own heart, minimalists. Say, no, thank you, it's enough. For them. So, and the parents, of course, get exasperated because they and their previous parents have struggled so much to get to earn more. You're a fool, you don't know, you're, you don't know. this is not to your advantage. Benefit, benefit, benefit. What is the ultimate benefit? What is the supreme benefit? Is to know that there is neither gain nor loss. There is perfection upon perfection upon perfection, not the way the mind of the human, who was animal for all these millions of years, judges it. The benefit is to have more. Soon, in the spiritual awakening, it will be more is less, not more is more, which is true in the two-dimensional model of earthly human reality. So you are both human and divine. Humanity is reaching a very fine point. It's not done, it's not correct. It's not. So all of the other ethics, moralities, religions have served a great purpose. But from now on, you have to transcend all of that. That's all in its place. But are you only a human? Why do you desire sleep? Why are you afraid of death? That's the give, big gift, fear of death. So as you as an animal, reckless, having given the autonomic system and all of the other things, you still have to fear that so you don't want to leave, lose it. Until you know there is no loss. Life is forever. And your life is not yours. It owns you. And therefore, your life is not separate from the perfect, eternal, timeless, spaceless, divine life. So what's the problem? Why are you scared? Why are you running? What, what, who? So you reach a point where theoretically in your heart's mind you may know. But now you have to live it. Until such time, it is your own nature. No longer something you like to talk or discuss or prove or to listen. It doesn't touch you anymore. You just know in truth there is only that truth and it appears in countless ways and waves and energies, including the little anger you may have every now and then. That's also another wave of energy. But once you enter into the anger box or into that field of energy of anger, it possesses you. That's why the same thing is generosity or goodness. You, you All of you people would like to be in, the, in a company that uplifts you because it has in it that field of energy. It's natural. And it's healthy and it is good. And I see now there is a universal rise in that. People, intelligent people, more and more being trained with all of the outer, even materialistic education, they become acute, 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 acute. And so people will not take it. They know that what you've said touched another zone that is more permanent. But you have to start with that which is temporary which is my mind, my reason, my biography, all of it is acceptable, but not enough. You and I and he and she and every one of us don't want proof through others or other things or through books. No, you want the experience. 
you want the experiential constancy and the ease of you accessing it so that you are always recalibrated. So you have another recharge. The usually you need to charge at the physical level, the material level, biological level, this level. Mentally you need to rest. You need. Until such time, you need to have that trickle charge in your spiritual battery, which is how can you forget the truth that you only exist because of that eternal light? How can you ever forget that? You may forget everything else, but that is not forgive, forgettable. You're hanging on something that was never yours. Who gave it to you? Who contracted you? What do you know? How do you know it's going to leave? And look at the amazing tricks of beautiful nature. The most vulnerable part of us is the part that we're hanging on, which is air. Air. Three, four minutes deprivation of that, and you become, you know, mind dead. Most people are anyway, without even that. But, but that's the truth. What about water? What about food? What about, what about social life and, and, and connectedness? That's another necessary and important part of our well-beingness. Any of these things, if you are deprived of, you are not full. Once you become more and more fulfilled, you become that at the door where that gateway is towards cosmic fulfillment. You know fulfillment was there before, but you had to practice your own way, slightly different in color, in size, nationality, in whatever, until such time you find fulfillment or God or that field. Is your nature perfect, eternal, cosmic life? So you have unified your life, so-called mind, 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 you want to cram it, the day is gone, I didn't feel it with life as is cosmic. So you're no longer frantic. But to be frantic actually is a sign of low human intelligence. But for how long you remain in that frantic? Surely a time comes or occasions in your life if you have gone for a year or two or three of sabbatical or retreats or whatever, you find no fulfillment and true, true, true supra-happiness is your own nature. So you won't anymore look for it. And you don't anymore have the illusion that somebody else can give it to you. He or she also is looking for it. Poor, poor thing. But you blame her. No, I really thought, you know, when I first met you, I really thought my fulfillment has come now after nine wives or 11 ma false marriages. Now it is. No, These are all mirrors, 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 mirrors. But where is the light of the mirror? What's the use of mirrors if there are no light? Have a thousand mirrors in total darkness have a thousand friends who can't speak or show or you can't touch them, you can't know they are even there. What you need is a reflection that touches parts of you to fix your own mirror, which is shattered. Why is it shattered? Its nature is for you to go through the pretense and the training of putting it together, put Humpty Dumpty together. Through what model? Perfection. What is perfection? No incongruity, no enmity, no discord, total perfect love, and so on. So this is all what it is. Everyone has to do it. And occasionally if you have a friend or a partner or a teacher or whatever, it's helpful. Teacher can't give you anything. The best teacher at best can show you how you have to get rid of what you had put upon yourself. Otherwise it becomes a cult, and it, as you know it ends up in hundreds and hundreds of different miseries. It's not on. A teacher who claims consciously or otherwise that I can give you more, whatever, run away. A teacher who is truly fulfilled and they are, as Bhagavad Gita and many other scriptures say, he is the same in praise by millions or by being disgraced by millions. His innermost is the same. Then that is, if you like, Safe. That's about it. <laughs> really. Otherwise, you are you're, you're going and you enter into a situation that intrinsically is dangerous. It's not going to work. If anybody says he can give you something, it's dangerous. If he or she can say, I can help you if you are desperate enough and if you are suffering enough, as everybody in the world is, to show you where you had 
caused your own suffering. That's useful. I think that's helpful. That's it. Thank them and go away. You don't need really, otherwise, why are you staying? I remember once with a great guru in, in India, and they asked him, for how long have you been teaching? He said, I can't tell you. So there was a lady ne sitting next to him. She said, I won't tell you because he was being interviewed, so he didn't want. He said, because otherwise she will tell you she's been with me for 40 years. 40 years she didn't learn it, so it shows you what an inadequate teacher I am. <laughs> so get it and go. You know, otherwise this loyalty is, is, an, is a shine, is a sign, is a proof of your inadequacy and the inadequacy of the teacher. It's really, <laughs> so I run away from anybody who says, I've known you for 30, 40 years. My God, said, this is too bad. <laughs> really, run. get it and move because it had got you. It isn't you're going to get anything. You're going to get your mistakes and turn away from them and not repeat them. It is boring. Repeat, repeat, repeat for how long? Be fresh, 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 fresh. No two moments are ever the same. Life is ever continuous. Your life is indistinguishable from cosmic life, from divine life, from the divine presence. So what more do you want? What more is there? What a generosity beyond limits. So then reminders. Whatever reminds you, your friends, your teacher, a book or a sound or something, that's fine. But thank Allah, who is the originator of all, but also have gratitude and correct courtesy to humanity. You can't just say, you know, it is the divine. But the divine has also created all of this, which is bovine. So don't deny that. You know, you are now reaching a point of that continuous, seamless, cosmic, connected, continuous. Both seas, connected and continuous. That's what it is. Once you begin to discover that, then you need to keep at it. It's, it's an engine that once it began to fire, you need to look after it a bit. Make sure you don't get again into your old silly habits, and then it becomes part of your nature. Why people repeat the same habit? Because it has a touch of continuity. The divine is ever continuous. Life is ever continuous. So you get the illusion, I've always done it like this. Don't always do that. Change it. Tomorrow, don't do that. So, so that your outer habits become flexible. And your inner is divine and all there. So you are truly always in absolute gratitude. Outwardly, you have to occasionally help and change, improve. Improve whatever you can. Less suffering, less agony less lies, less brutality, that's all. So as you flow with nature, a lot of the world's suffering now and the climate change, a lot, a lot, that we have gone against the natural flow. The natural flow is to be generous, is to give and take. But the last two, three hundred years, the whole world had become too calculating, too materialistic. But there is the other side of it, which is contentment for its own sake. And if you're fortunate enough to be able to do that, then you find from nowhere, least you expect it, somebody will give you water, somebody will help you, somebody will take you. Be a destitute occasionally. You know, in the early days of the rise of Sufism, in, especially in North Africa, the kings knew that these people are ahead because they no longer want to keep a kingdom. They are with the king of kings. So they occasionally, some of the wiser, sultans will want to send their sons to a great, accomplished, enlightened being. So often, I mean, there were a few cases that I came across and I knew it was true. The teacher would say, only I take your son if he is going to obey my orders. And so the sultan, the king says, yes, yes, yes. So the first order was that you're going to go to the filthiest public toilet and for a month clean it. Now, this is the son of the king. Everybody knew he is the prince. So if he did it, then he is beyond any concern about his ego, about reputation. About... So I'm not saying that, you know, find the teacher who will ask you to do that. But at least don't go with all kinds of egos. I've read all the books. I've been to 900 gurus. It shows your inadequacy and the inadequacy of all the gurus. So, <laughs> so be honest, be real, and don't have spiritual ambition. 
Worldly ambition is fine. Well, you want a bigger house, and bigger car, whatever, that's fine. It's childish. But spiritual ambition is very dangerous. The worst thing that I see more and more is spiritual materialism. Really, it's awful. I'm sure you too have experienced. So watch out for these things. These are big pitfalls. Other pitfalls is, I made a mistake. I didn't look properly. I was in a hurry because I wanted to greet you or I wanted to. Be honest, be real, and laugh at yourself. That's why, that's why it's important for people on this so-called spiritual path, every path is spiritual, is on this so-called they can laugh at each other because you know your agenda is not to humiliate the human being. You can't humiliate human. But if you are on a path of getting rid of your own self-inflicted ego, then be with people who will poke at it, laugh at it, and you laugh at them, and it's a relief. So enjoy it. Be discriminating. Don't waste your time. You don't know for how long you live. And you don't know how, for how long you have that energy to drive you. You may suddenly have, as everybody knows, a few months or a few weeks, you have a big drive. And a lot of openings come to you. And some other times they don't. So flow with the flow of the wind. When it touches your sails, and the wind, go with it. And then suddenly there is nothing. There is a doldrum. There is no movement. Also, change your attitude in that and be quiet and do something else. Go gardening. Go whatever. So flow with it without denying that you are in a world that calculates every minute, every hour, every day, and so on and so on. Until such time, you lose your idea about time, years. Or, but not also suddenly say, oh, I, did, I thought my, the meeting was next year. Don't be stupid. You, you heard that it was this afternoon at 3.30 or that. So don't pretend. Don't play. <laughs> but in your heart of heart, for you, is timeless. Your ruh, your soul, your reality is timeless. What greater gift than that? <laughs> when I was 18, I, um, I was given a book by my uncle. And it was by the German philosopher Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz or Leibniz. And it was called The Discourse on Metaphysics. He wrote another book called The Theodicy and Monodology. And in the very first chapter, in the very first paragraph, in a nutshell, he said there was a divine perfection, a divine beauty, a divine love, a divine magnificence, a divine order, a divine presence that few people get a glimpse of. But those that do, their lives are changed. And the trajectory of their life, if shifted from the horizontal to the vertical. When I read that, I got tears in my eyes. And I'm sure we've all had moments where we've got graced by tears of inspiration. And there's a lot of gratitude, even though I don't know if I really comprehended everything he was saying. So I went on a pursuit. I wanted to be one of those individuals that understood that state of awareness. My uncle gave me that book. He also sent me another book that was by Paul Dirac, who was a Nobel Prize winner in physics, that went on and developed something from Einstein and Schrodinger and Heisenberg, and wrote a book on particle and antiparticles. And he said that for every bit of matter, there's an antimatter. And I was talking, it was talking about the union of these opposites made light. You take a particle, a positron, and a negative particle, negatron or electron, and put them in a, an accelerator, and they slam together and make light. And I thought in my naivety, I wonder what would happen if we took the positive and negative experiences that we labeled and judged and we slammed them together in our mind, could we make enlightenment? And so I went on a pursuit of studying psychology and philosophy and theology, attempting to find information that could, you know, make sense out of this, this paradox. It was in 1935 when this paradox was really uncovered by Einstein, Rosen, and Podolsky. And I wanted to know a way of, a practical way, for any human being 
to get a glimpse of this light. Because I believe that there is a, a divine light that's the synthesis and synchronicity of all complementary opposites that could ever be perceived. And it all it occurs at all scales of existence, from the infinite micro to the infinite macro. And our mind has the capacity to engage in this synthesis and this synchronicity, where we extract out space and time from the mind and become really present and become honored by this divine perfection. It has no location. It's non-local. It's a causal, but it's always present. That led me to working on studying cells, studying brain, studying physiology, trying to find a methodology that I could develop to assist people in honoring this light that's inside our misperceptions. That's the hidden order inside the apparent chaos. I realized that we were flittering around like a butterfly going from one judgment to the next, inculcating and subordinating to one morality or s superior um, authority to the next, through tradition or non-tradition. And we were constantly being consciously and unconsciously split apart. If we're infatuate with somebody, we're conscious of the upsides, we're unconscious of the downsides. If we're resentful to somebody, we're conscious of the downsides, we're unconscious of the upsides, both of which are illusions, but we get trapped in them. I wondered what would happen if we were to put those two sides, the conscious and the unconscious, as Jung would describe together at the same time, in the same moment, in the same space. And I realized that the questions we ask make us conscious of unconscious content. So I formulated questions to assist people in becoming aware of what they're unconscious of. Because when they're fully conscious, they're, you might say, blessed by the grace of this divine presence of light. So what I found is that at the moment we perceive something, our brain actually has the content of its opposite accessible. And if we ask the right questions, it is revealed. And we call it now memory and anti-memory, just like a particle and antiparticle. And we realize that whatever we are trying to run away from, the opposite is always present and nothing's ever missing. But we aren't seeing it, and therefore we're run externally, extrinsically by the world around us, instead of called from the soul within us. The moment we actually ask the right question and become present, because we put the pairs of opposites together at the same time, we get a glimpse of this divine, and it confirms it with a tear of inspiration that whispers to us the direction of our next action not out of morality, not out of good or right or wrong, or, but just out of knowing and out of a love act. In a stream of consciousness that we pass through in our journey, in every millisecond or microsecond or infinitesimal second, in that moment, whatever that perception is, there's that pair of opposites. If we become aware of them synchronously, the pair of opposites, we transcend the judgment, we get a glimpse of the divine, and we realize that split second by split second, we call it Planck's length of time, every split billionth of a second is nothing but love. All else was just an illusion that we got trapped in based on our judgments. But our judgments were our necessary journey. Our animal nature wants to avoid a predator and seek a prey. But we realize eventually that the desire for that which is unobtainable and the desire to avoid that which is unavoidable is the source of our suffering. And we realize that we, if we have prey without predator, we get gluttonous and fat, sluggish, and we increase the probability of a predator wanting to attack us because there's a lot of calories with the least effort. And if we get nothing but predator, we starve and we have nothing because we become emaciated. So we must have the predator and the prey. We must have the, the dualities honored equally, synchronously, to access the grace. As long as we're addicted to pride or infatuation or pleasure for hedonistic pursuits, we're missing out on the divine mastery of our own calling that's innate within us, that tra transcends these illusions. So our job is to realize um, that there's the divine and nothing's missing. The master lives in a world of transformation, never the illusions of gain and loss, never the illusions of 
I have to have or I have to get a weight of. There's nothing to seek or avoid ultimately. The presence of love is omnipresent. And the presence of the grace that we have access to is you know, we nothing to search for. If we're searching for it, we're denying it. And I, I love the way you said about the gurus. I, I love having fun with gurus because uh, there's paradoxes in some of their teachings. And, I, and, I, and uh, if somebody is uh, thinking they're dependent on them, then they're, they're exaggerating somebody and minimizing themselves, which blocks the very growth itself. Nobody's worth putting on pedestals or pits. Everybody's worth putting in hearts. And the moment we do, uh, the guru, G-U-R-U, emerges spontaneously, and there's nothing to be searching for. We have its presence. And I don't think there's any place or time that we have to go find. There's no sacred place that we have to go search for to find it. It's always inside our heart. We look for it everywhere else, but it's right there. And we open our heart in a state of equanimity the moment we have the synthesis and synchronicity of opposites. And it's the quality of the questions we ask. And we become a revelation, an inspired revelation towards that, that natural presence that's there. So our ability to um, honor the journey is... I always say humbleness to divinity is what gives us certainty for humanity. And then our exemplification of certainty for humanity uh, exemplifies and guides through our mirror neurons and our chameleon effect. It, it, it awakens a yearning for each individual without saying anything, without even being needed. That, uh, that paused present moment that gives them a glimpse of that divine which starts their, their engine running for the realization that they have nothing missing inside themselves. At the level of the essence of the soul, nothing's missing. At the level of the existence of the senses, things appear to be missing. But those are the illusions of the senses that we get trapped in, uh, but necessarily along our journey, because each of us have our own path that we navigate through. And our, whatever is highest on our value at the moment uh, may guide that path, but the moment we realize it, we transcend even that value system. And we realize that that's just part of the journey, too. So I, I find that what uh, is being said, I'm, I'm sitting here and, and having a lot of love for this because I, I relate to what has been the wisdom he's, he's uh, sharing. But I think, uh, you know, it, I, I still have some of my attachments. I still like to eat. <laughs> I still like to, uh, you know, travel and see the world. I always say that there, there's a... There's an infinite number of experiences of love at all scales of existence for eternity. And what greater love could there be but the realization that there's, there's no way out of love? <laughs> you, can't, you can't escape it. People searching for it are missing it because there's no way out of it. It, it, it has us. <laughs> there's no escape of the divine love. And there's no, uh, there's no only one pathway there. There's not even a pathway there because that's an illusion of space and time. It's always present. There's nothing to have to go and, and find. And I've been graced by uh, the, the comical, the comedy uh, and the tragedies of my illusions, all of which are exactly the feedbacks I need on my journey. So none of them are mistakes. We only think there's a mistake when we compare our actions to somebody else's values. And we only think they make a mistake when we compare their actions to our values. And both of those are elusive. So we might as well just get inside and dance and have a, have a good joke because uh, the second you get proud, you get humbled. And the second you get humbled, you get lifted. And the second you get centered, you feel present. Mm. And there's nothing but love in that presence. And you can't lose anybody or can't miss anybody mm. that you love because they're always present. There's no space and time separation. So I'm, uh, I'm pretty grateful for... This is great. <laughs> you had a wonderful description and prescription at the same time. Really, descriptions and prescriptions have to resonate, you know, although we separate them because the mind is to separate. Yes. But this, you have just had a beautiful exposure of that. So the other point of illusion or delusion that was inferred to is that we are, as human beings, repetitive. We always, we are also taken to habits and so on. So these are the dangers on, <coughs> on the path. Watch out. We, by nature, we get comfort and ease with repetitiveness. The same place, same thing, same food, same flavor. From the moment you're born, you know, you're, 
there is the story of the holy fool in a village and he was looking for something so people always trying to be helpful so few people stopped by and eventually there was a whole lot of people at night looking for the ring missing ring so eventually once a person dared to ask him but where did you lose your ring he said there so but why are we all looking here because he said there is a bit more light here so there is no light so this is our situation we all go for the familiar. We all go, well, this is what my ancestors said. We all mother. So it's interesting. We, we want that which has been there forever. But the truth has been there forever. The light has always been there forever. As for the attachment that you, we have, as long as you are breathing, as long as you are still within this form, we have attachment. We have likes. We have dislikes. Nothing wrong with that is the extent that it possesses you. Imam Ali has got a beautiful teaching in terms of, you know, modesty and asceticism. He says asceticism means that nothing possesses you. It doesn't mean you don't possess things or own things, have things, give things. As long as you are human, you have to act within that zone also of space and time and the limitations of the second womb which is this earth. So we have, we have to have courtesy at the lower side of us. We have courtesy at the mind and the higher. And you have courtesy towards the light of lights. There you enter into a cosmic silence from which every sound, every music, every whatever else emerges. That's all what there is. The rest is to care <coughs> for also the different levels of your own makeup. The physical, the chemical, the biological. The, that's all. And don't deny any of these things, but more than all, recalibrate always with the perfection of that silence from which cosmic love emerges, which contains everything, which connects everything. That's all what there is. And to be with like-minded, like-hearted people. No blame, no claim. And again, humor, spiritual humor. You find, especially religious people and so on, they become very grim. Because they are scared of losing the religious, whatever it is, the structural part. You see. Lose it all. Lose yourself. The whole business is to lose yourself into your soul. That's all. And be with people whom you enjoy and they are happy to be with you and so on. And I must express really great, great pleasure for me also to be here this afternoon. Really with Dr. De Martin. Really, thank you very much for having arranged it. Good luck to you, and thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, thank you. <laughs> really. Now go home. <laughs> <laughs> if you have one, if you don't, then I think... I'm homeless. <laughs> no, I think Cape Town is excelling in that, so I mean... Yes. I, <laughs> I don't live anywhere. I travel full time. How, how, how wonderful. Yes, I don't live anywhere. Come on, somebody say something. Go on. Oh, here she is, yes. She want... Thank you so much uh, for that riveting conversation. It was, uh, Uncle Eunice was, was whispering in my ear and he says, if you close your eyes and you don't know the voice, it's almost, it's the same, right? And uh, this was my excitement, my kid-like excitement of being able to bring these two great minds together. Um, because of that similarity, there are, there are not so many people who speak on this depth. There's not so many people who speak, so many teachers who speak about this work in this way and about consciousness and the divine self in this way. And to find two people from two separate sides of the world to come together, to be able to have that conversation, Oh, there's nothing but gratitude and love for that. Please so, le leave your wallet behind. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, Sheikh Fadlala, thank you so much. You're welcome. I would really do appreciate thank it. You. I am delighted. Thank yeah. you. Yes, thank, thank you for this. Lovely. Thank you. Dr. Thank you. Di Martini, to you, thank you so much as well. I know we had to change your schedule quite a bit in order for you to be here. Oh. And um, Yasin, can you just bring me those books over there, please, my love? Mm -hmm. Dr. Di Martini, we know that one of your uh, greatest loves is research. Yes, I love that. <laughs> and uh, 
what better gift to give you for your research, for say thank you, as well as an early birthday present, because we do know that's coming up later oh. on in this month, uh, to give you some books of Sheikh Fadlala. Thank you very much. You don't need any of that. Yes. A round of applause for our speakers. <laughs> really, he doesn't. <laughs>